evidence do we have for evolution? This is Roman numeral three in your, uh, your outlines. So it's going to be the fossil record and evidence from homology because evolution leaves observable signs. So first thing is fossils. What is a fossil? So fossils can be, I think most of the time we think of fossils as bones, which is a good fossil, um, but there are other t ways that organisms in the past leave a signature um, that they were there, they were present. So sometimes it's gonna be um, formed by you know, plants that get mineralized, that they don't decay, yet they somehow get fossilized. <clears throat> um, there can be footprints, those are fossils. Um, sometimes insects get sort of entombed in amber, which is basically sap of a tree, and it gets hard over time, it becomes like a rock. And this is a fossil, and then this is um, the tusk. So sometimes it's just part of an organism that you find, not the whole thing. Um, but if you find a huge tusk like this, it's pretty obvious that it belonged some, to some very great big animal. <laughs> Um, so fossil records, um, there's the way that um, scientists can look at a fossil record is where they appear in the earth. So I think it should make sense to everybody that if you have you dig up something close to the surface, then it's a recent organism that has died and been buried there. But if you go down half a mile or a mile down into the earth, then the organisms or the bones that you dig up there have been there a lot longer, right? So you can get a relative order of the organisms by their depth in the earth. Relative. However, you can also put an exact date on that carbon. You can carbon date it and you put an exact age on the fossil. So there's the relative order of things and then there's a carbon date. So you, it's able to, you are able to date a fossil. There are things called transitional fossils there. Are, um, so what a transitional fossil is, is a fossil that has um, intermediate um, anatomy that looks like an organism that's lived a long time before and maybe a present day organism. So Lucy is one of those really famous transitional fossils that scientists have found relatively recently. Um, Lucy is thought to be a transitional fossil between um, our ancestors and humans. And so she has been carbon dated and they put her at 3.2 million years ago, which is really amazing. 3.2 million years um, ago, this creature um, lived and inhabited the earth. And you can see that when they put her together, that um, her Bones are really similar to human bones and to ape bones. Um, she's standing in an upright fashion, and you can tell this stuff from looking at the, the way the bones fit together. Um, for those of you who are going to take anatomy, um, you don't get too much into this. I think that would be more of an anthropology class, but very, very similar to humans and also apes. So this is a really great transitional fossil. Some transitional fossils will also... Um, um, have interesting um, sort of discoveries for people. So this is a fossil of a bird. So this is an imprint, okay? So this is a very um, dinosaur looking like bird, right? Or has the, the bones of, it looks like a dinosaur, but it also has feathers on it. So this is one of those fossils that we realized that dinosaurs had feathers, or at least some dinosaurs had feathers. And uh, they use those feathers, they think, for warmth instead of for flight. So they think that when feathers were first kind of forming very, very early on, that was probably some kind of like warm, warming mechanism for their bodies. All right, so evidence from homology. So if you compare how bodies are put together, like structurally, with the anatomical similar, similarities, um, that's homology. So homology is the comparison of body structure between different species and attests that evolution is a remodeling process in which ancestral structures become modified as they take on new functions. So if you look at the different homologous structures in the colors orange and beige and yellow, you can see that 
human, cat, whale, and bat forearms, right, our forelimbs, are very similar. Um, but they're used for really different things. The, this is for flight, right? Whales, this structure is for swimming. Cats and humans, we have more similar, but, you know, not exactly. But the way that they were put together is very similar. So there are two long bones side by side, and then a set of short bones called carpals that are in our wrist. Cats have the same structure. Whales have the same structure, and then so do bats. So it turns out that these are all mammals, and they're all related to each other, and we can look at the homology of their bones to show us that, that we do have a common ancestor. We're related in some way because we're built the same way. Even though over time, these structures can get modified and be different, right? This bone here, it's kind of glued into this other bone, and it's a lot thinner. These are obviously shorter and fatter, but the general anatomy is there. Let's talk about the other term, which is analogous. Analogous structures have the same function, but very different structure, so no evidence of relatedness. So analogy would be bat wing, butterfly wing, bird wing. So all of these guys are wings. They're all used for flight. But does it tell you that a bird is, has to be related closely to a butterfly? And a butterfly has to be related closely to a bat because they all have wings. No, you can't use that, right? If we dissected a bird wing, it would be completely different than a butterfly wing, right? There's no bones in a butterfly wing. So you can look at an analogous structures arise because you have something to do that's the same. All of these creatures fly, but it does not point to um, evolutionary relatedness. You can't say they're related. All you can say is that they all fly. So the true-false question here is the more homologous structures two organisms share, the more closely related they are. Right? You can pause it if you want to think about it, but this is a true statement. The more homologous structures two organisms share, so if we have lots and lots of these parts of our body, like physical parts of our body that are the same or very similar, right, then of course we're getting more related to each other than something else that doesn't have those homologous structures. So I want to mention before we move on to vestigial structures, there is um, a, a blurb on convergent evolution. Species from different evolutionary branches may have certain structures that are superficially similar because they share the same living environment. So that's going to be here. So organisms that fly, right? So the word convergent evolution is that the bat evolved a wing separately from the butterfly, evolved a wing separately from the bird. But since they all share the same space, they all need to glide through the air that, um, or, you know, fly that they evolved these things separately but converged on this wing, this thing called a wing that's flat and broad and, you know, carries the wind underneath the wing. Um, that is convergent evolution. So your different organisms converge. They converge on creating a wing, even though the wing itself can be formed in different ways. So I hope that makes sense. Um, let's talk about vestigial structures. So vestigial structures are other things that point to evolution or this, this fact that organisms can change over time. And we sometimes retain a trait from the past organisms that we share in common with. Not that we descended directly from, but that we share a common ancestor with. So this little guy right here and this little tip of the ear, that's a vestigial, this. So let me define it. Vestigial structures are structures that are no longer useful or they're not being used or they're not functional in any way on the modern organism, but they existed, they're a harbinger of the past. So you can look at this and say, like, why do we have that? Oh, it's because it was something that functioned in the past of our ancestors that are still around. This is very interesting for some of you guys. Snakes actually have a pelvic girdle and some hind limbs. Okay, so in the past, snakes actually had limbs like a lizard. And then over time, they evolved into an environment where they didn't need those feet anymore. And the hind limbs um, basically became smaller and smaller, but they still develop, so they still have them. So it's something that we can think of. So, so knowing that they have this vestigial structure, you would say like, oh, well, they must be related to some kind of organism that had hind limbs, right, in the past. 
Um, the whale example I also have. Um, let me actually look, go back to this this picture here. Right? Why do whales have bones that look like ours? So they actually evolved from a land mammal. So evolved first on the land, had these structures to be walking limbs, and then when they went into the ocean, spent most of the time in the ocean, then these features got modified over time to become a, a fin. But this is, uh, you can think of this as a vestigial structure too, because they don't need to have the, um, sort of the anatomy of a limb. Okay, so what's our, our concept check? Vestigial structures. So think about it. If you want to pause, go ahead and pause. The question is, I'm oh, sorry, the question, the answer is, I have to read through these too. Are remnants of features that serve some function in organisms ancestor but not used today? Letter A. Okay. All right, let's look at embryology. So you can also compare the development process across different organisms and look at the relatedness there. So early stages of development, called an embryo, is very, very similar for a lot of different vertebrates. Okay, so it kind of points to the fact that all of the vertebrates, let me show you the picture here. Here's a fish, a salamander, a tortoise, a chicken, a pig, a cow, a rabbit, and a human. Look how similar we all are in those very first stages of embryology. Okay. What this shows you is that in the past, there was a vertebrate that developed in this way. And then over time, right, we, we start to develop different kinds of vertebrates, the fish vertebrate, the tortoise vertebrate, the pig, the human. But we all um, retain this embryological stage that are very, very similar. So if you look, we all have a tail. Every single one of these organisms has a tail in the early embryo. We all have what's called pharyngeal pouches. Okay, so we have little, these are basically gill slits. These would develop into gills if you're a fish, um, post anal tail. But along the way, you start to diverge in your development, right? Humans will lose the tail, and, um, you know, the fish will retain those gill slits, and we won't have those. But it's just a way of looking at the similarities of development, right? So we can look at our embryology and look at relatedness between these different vertebrates. So we have to be related. And then lastly, which we are the most modern kind of um, way of looking at evolution is with DNA sequences. So we can actually grab an organism's DNA, sequence it, right? So we know exactly the sequence of A's, T's, C's, and G's. We look at how similar maybe our sequences with a chimpanzee or with a gorilla. So look at this chart. So if a chimpanzee is 100%, so if we did two chimps, <clears throat> their DNAs would match 100%. How do we um, compare with a chimp? We're about, you know, 97 point something percent similar with a chimp. So we're very, very similar. So that means that we are more related to a chimp than we are to a gorilla. Uh, or to an orangutan, okay, or, or in, in terms of this box, who's most related to the chimp? It's the human, right? Um, the gorilla, the orangutan, the gibbon, the old world monkey, these guys are actually not as related closely uh, as we are to the chimp. So there, um, there is a scientist at uh, UCLA who calls the humans the third chimpanzee. There's a couple different chimps on the planet, and then we're the third. Um, you can take that as however you want. It's kind of funny to think about. Um, all right, so so genes and proteins, right? So we look at the molecular relationship between uh, DNA and pure proteins between organisms. So we can look at molecular biology. So remember, all of the all living things use the same genetic code. So really, if you think about it, right, everything on the planet started off as sort of one kind of living organism, one kind of living cell that used this um, code as the code for making proteins. And so all of life diverged from this first cell. And so we're all related in some way, back, back, way, way, way back, a uh, very, very long time ago. Okay, so last topic here is gonna be our evolutionary tree. So this is Darwin's drawing of an evolutionary tree. 
um, this is uh, how you should look at so what you should do is we'll go through this evolutionary tree and you should be able to read it and be able to answer questions based on this tree so um, in this example originally birds and reptiles were in separate classes of vertebrates so people had birds in a separate completely separate than reptiles because obviously if you look at a bird and you look at a snake you don't see any similarity there however it turns out that um, they're very closely related now that we have our DNA sequences and we know that our reptiles our dinosaurs had feathers it gives more evidence to the fact that birds are actually descendants of reptiles so um, which is really interesting so if you look at all of these different reptiles, right, snakes, snakes and lizards, crocodiles, pterosaurs, uh, some dinosaurs and some birds, they're all on the same um, branch of our um, evolutionary tree. And when you look at the branching, so this fork in the road is where you have a branch. So before that would be a common ancestor to both the dinosaurs and the birds. And then that common organism branched and, uh, you know, one branch became birds and the other branch became these Saurischians. I don't know how to say that. Right. So let's see if we can answer uh, something. Let's go through this one. Which number represents the most recent common ancestor of humans and canaries? Well, first of all, this one is nice because it has numbers, right? Here's a number one. So there's some kind of common ancestor here to the right. Um, oh, so the common ancestor here, if you look at just this ancestor is going to be the common ancestor for everything to the right. Because if you follow lungfishes back, they're gonna land on this ancestor. If you follow amphibians back, they're gonna fall into this ancestor. Mammals as well, right? So, this is going to be the further back in time so the farther left you go the more back in time you are and then what you see here is what's on the planet right now so this is present time so if you look at for example tetrapod limbs so there is a placement of this new feature that living things have which is four limbs tetrapod means you have four limbs so what has tetrapod limbs the common ancestor this the common ancestor here right is going to evolve tetrapod limbs and then if you go look at what what has um, come away from that common ancestor we have amphibians like frogs which have four limbs we have mammals with four limbs snakes and lizards so snakes lost their limbs but lizards still have them crocodiles ostriches and birds okay so everything that is Falling from this has those four limbs, right? So tetrapods is this yellow bar down. But what does not have a tetrapod limb? It's the one that didn't follow this branch down. It's this one, right? So lungfishes don't never evolved four limbs. They're just um, sort of like eels. All right, now what's the next new thing to evolve? The amnion, right? So the amnion developed here on this branch. So what an amnion is is a fluid-filled environment where baby where your developing embryo is so it's a kind of a, a weird concept but um, egg laying um, organisms have an amnion and so do mammals because internally in our uh, uterus the embryo develops inside an amniotic sac so every from everything from here on is going to have an amnion mammals etc etc then we have another new feature here feathers so are crocodiles going to have feathers no because feathers developed on this branch and so anything to the right of this branch, ostriches and hawks and birds will have feathers. So let's see if we can answer the question, which, is a no, which number represents the most recent common ancestor of humans and canaries? So humans are mammals and canaries are birds. So if we look at mammals and canaries and we wanna follow them both back to where they meet for the very first time, in, it's gonna be number three. So the most recent is number three. That's the most recent common ancestor that we have. Of course, we share ancestor number two and ancestor number one, right? We have those in common as well, but it's not the most recent. So the most recent one's gonna be number three, okay? All right, so let's stop there.